animals were among the first subjects sketched by humans. Many cave paintings depict either animals or thumbprints, an anatomical feature that distinguishes us in zoological classification. It is likely that the need to understand the diversity of the animal world initially met a practical imperative, such as distinguishing the edible from the toxic or the fierce from the docile, but also served artistic motivations. Long before the work of Darwin or Crick and Watson, our ancestors were fascinated by the visual similarities and differences among the creatures around them. Early scholars probably sensed that a general principle unified all forms of life. Their classification attempts often reveal more about their own ideas than about the animal world they sought to organize. The history of zoological classification has generated a frequently redundant jargon. Most of the time, the terms classification, taxonomy, and systematics refer to the same concept, the identification of species and their organization. Scientists make subtle distinctions between these terms, but few pay much attention to them. The term phylogenetic refers to classifications based on common ancestors and genealogical relationships among animals. Phylogeny means origin of the tribe, implying that animals have diversified through an evolutionary process. Phonetics, on the other hand, studies the similarities and differences among living beings without considering their evolutionary relationships. This approach was popular before the acceptance of the theory of evolution and is still used when observations do not reveal evolutionary links. Evolutionary biology, in contrast, encompasses the study of evolutionary processes, the origin of life, species modification over time, divergences between species, speciation, and the factors influencing these processes, without focusing on animal classification itself. God formed from the soil all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the sky, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them, each was to bear the name the man would give it. The man gave names to all the domesticated animals, the birds of the sky, and all the wild beasts, but for the man, he did not find a helper suitable for him. Zoology holds a significant place in the scriptures. The earliest systems of naming and classifying animals come from the Judeo-Christian tradition. Adam was created on the same day as the beasts of the earth, a surprising nod to the modern concept of humans as animals, and one of his first tasks was to name the animals. Interestingly, God only created Eve because non-human creatures were unsuitable companions and helpers for Adam. Particularly due to the dietary restrictions concerning certain animals, biblical animal classification prevailed for a long time. For instance, Leviticus chapter 11 contains what we would now call decision trees regarding the choice of edible animals, mentioning criteria such as whether they have split hooves and chew the cud, or whether aquatic animals have fins and scales. These rules may have arisen from health issues related to microbial or parasitic contamination, and they persisted in Jewish dietary laws. These practical injunctions, which were once seen as life-or-death signals, inspired early classifications. Another source of Western zoological classifications comes from the Greeks, whose views, driven more by enlightened curiosity than survival needs, seem surprisingly modern. Most of their thoughts on biology are summarized in Aristotle's natural philosophy, though it is hard to distinguish his actual discoveries from those borrowed from often uncredited predecessors. Aristotle lived on Lesbos, one of the largest islands in the Aegean Sea. His descriptions of the island's fauna, especially the animals in its warm, shallow waters, form the basis of his writings. He emphasized that his works were based on observing nature, not repeating the errors of his predecessors, which is mostly true. For each animal he encountered, he analyzed its specific traits and deduced its affinities with other creatures. 
He recognized that while many characteristics are common to all animals, features like coloration, shape, or size are unreliable criteria for grouping them. Instead, he advocated organizing animals by their diet, habitat, behavior, respiration, possible metamorphoses, social or solitary nature, nocturnal or diurnal habits, domestication status, aggressiveness or timidity, egg-laying or live birth, and whether they were stationary or mobile in the sea. However, Aristotelian thought was not as modern as often claimed. Despite delivering the first known scientific classification of animals, Aristotle remained tied to the metaphysical system he imposed on the world. He was one of the early proponents of the Great Chain of Being, which hierarchically ranked creatures from plants to animals, then humans, and finally gods. Although inconsistent with the abundant animal diversity he described, this strict hierarchy formed the basis of many subsequent classifications up until the 19th century. Comfortingly, Aristotle placed humans above other animals, close to the gods' perfection. Yet, he sometimes contradicted himself when considering humans as other animals, remaining a staunch supporter of the great chain of being. Another landmark in the journey towards modern zoological classifications is the Physiologus, written anonymously, probably in the 2nd century AD in Alexandria. It presents various North African animals, complemented by North European species and mythical creatures, forming a rich menagerie with theological lessons. Imbued with Christian doctrine, this work described 40 animals identified less by their zoological features and more by their associated religious symbols. Each creature thus played a role in the Christian narrative, often derived from Greek parables illustrating particular theological principles. In this religious bestiary, animals primarily represented the word, and zoology was seen as part of theology, compromising the logical development of this science for centuries. The etymologies by Isidore of Seville marked a unique detour in zoological traditions at the beginning of the 7th century. This colossal work is one of the earliest encyclopedic compilations of knowledge, but it was marred by the persistence of ancient concepts. As the title of his work suggests, Isidore believed that understanding the hidden meaning of names revealed certain inherent qualities of the named entities, and vice versa. Thus, to him, what was elephantine was directly related to the great grey pachyderm. A modern reader might simply assume that an animal could be named by analogy or that the name of an animal could be used metonymically. In the long history of zoological classifications, the etymologies is probably the quintessential example of an organization of the animal world whose logic surpasses the understanding available at the time. Regardless, this book, which was tirelessly reprinted during the medieval period in Europe and the Islamic world, had a considerable influence. These texts were the forerunners of the classifications that appeared at the end of the Middle Ages. Aristotelian thought, Isidore's obsession with names, and a Christianity centered on its own logic inspired one of the most spectacular artistic representations of zoological organization, the bestiary. Bestiaries flourished in the Middle Ages, especially in France, England, and Scotland during the 12th and 13th centuries. Although their sophistication varied, their structure and purpose were remarkably consistent. Whether their authors were inspired by ancient texts or contemporary observations, their evolution is itself a subject of study, with these works forming families with their own genealogy. Spectacular iconography made bestiaries accessible to the illiterate masses. It is likely that readers did not question the creatures depicted, these animals had a meaning that transcended their physical appearance, and their real existence mattered less than what they conveyed about God. Their symbolism remained simplistic. Some animals, particularly those most familiar to medieval readers, sometimes had multiple roles, a goat, for instance, could represent a sinner consumed by the flames of hell in one context, then the omniscient Christ in another. Mapmons also became popular in the Middle Ages, these giant maps stylized the geography of the known world. 
Most of them positioned the three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, around a centrally placed Jerusalem, reflecting the central position of God. On the periphery, strange lands were depicted, populated by exotic and monstrous creatures, often distortions of real animals, or devilish chimerae that were part beast, part human, meant to frighten believers. The most striking examples of these zoological curiosities are found on the margins of the Hereford Mappa Mundi, where creatures with dog heads or cynocephaly, perhaps inspired by baboons, frolic. This conception evolved starting from the Renaissance, when the religiosity of medieval bestiaries gave way to more objective observations. The 16th century saw the dissemination of publications such as the detailed Historia Animalium by the Swiss philosopher Conrad Gessner. Fifty years later, Ulissi Aldrovandi followed with his vast collection of zoological curiosities in Bologna, leading to works like De Pisibus and Ornithologia among many other books. The importance of animal diversity ended the concept of the great chain of being, whose successive degrees became less apparent, and whose hierarchy seemed simplistic. This linear gradation transformed into a branching tree and other forms more singular than medieval artists would have dared to imagine. The origins of the Mesopotamian flood myths are likely over 5,000 years old and remain unknown. While a universal flood is impossible, these myths might have been inspired by the flooding in the Tigris and Euphrates basins or could reflect the rise in sea levels after the last ice age. The present-day Persian Gulf may once have been a dry, uninhabited land. Adapting this universal myth, the biblical Genesis describes the flood, the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, for I have found you righteous in this generation. Of all clean animals, you shall take seven pairs, a male and its female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. For in seven days, I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. The monumental scale of Noah's adventure and his methodical categorization of animals, clean and unclean, male and female, to save all living creatures, served as an incredible source of inspiration for medieval illuminators. One superb example is found in the Psalm Le Roy. This manual of moral and religious instruction was written at the request of Philip the Bold by his Dominican confessor, Brother Laurent Dubois in 1279. Clearly, depicting the Ark was challenging, each species was confined to a small, monastic-like cell where it barely fit. As a result, many medieval representations of the Ark resembled scientific tables, such as the periodic table of elements, more than seaworthy vessels capable of withstanding the deluge. Jan Johnston was a Scottish-born naturalist and physician who lived in Poland and traveled extensively throughout Northern Europe. His zoological observations were authoritative for a century. In the mid-17th century, he completed one of his major works, A Natural History of Insects, Bloodless Marine Animals, Fish, Whales, and Birds. This comprehensive and precise work greatly benefited from the exceptional contributions of Swiss-born engraver Matthias Marion. Coming from a wealthy family in Basel, Marion was not only an artist but also a renowned publisher. His engravings, notable for their delicacy, conveyed a deep sensitivity to the animals depicted, which seemed to leap or fly off the page. Marion passed away at the age of 56, but his children turned out to be even more talented artists. His daughter Maria surpassed him in influence. <laughs>